Okay, uh, uh, today is the 2nd of March uh, 2022, and we'll talk about uh, an interesting architect, Lori Baker, uh, who was born on, on the 2nd of March 1917. So today is his birthday. So this was, uh, this was the man, a very interesting man, not just in terms of, uh, of his work, his architecture, but also in terms of his past in his life. A man who was concerned with something that most often today, these days, we ignore, and that is spirit and morality. And uh, yes, we talk today about, uh, or these days about, um, sustainability, but this very modest man uh, assumed what we call sustainability years before this world became fashionable. And uh, not just at the level of his work, but also at the level of his own life. He was uh, called a Gandhian, Gandhian architect. What is that? Well, he's an architect, a Gandhi-like architect in a way. In a way, kind of a saintly figure in architecture, an architecture which has had has uh, many so-called stars, but not so many so-called saints. He was not probably a saint, although, although he, uh, when we read a little bit about his biography, we see uh, a very unusual man uh, trying to find his way through uh, through life. So. Um, he was a man probably who knew what suffering is, but he also knew the joy of, of creativity. And we are going even to see him on a mot motorcycle, enjoying himself um, running on that motorcycle, although it was not him who was, um, um, you know, the, uh, how to say, the, the person uh, in charge of the motorcycle. Uh, this kind of person is uh, not only that he was born in Great Britain, but he, he lived most of his life in Southeast Asia and in India. Uh, but, uh, you know, this kind of modest wisdom, I think we miss. We miss badly in today's world. And maybe we didn't suffer enough, although uh, the war in Ukraine uh, uh, seems to suggest to us that uh, suffering um, is not far away from us, maybe in uh, very tragic um, uh, manifestations and, uh, and, and, and dimensions. Here he is, you know, almost childlike. He lived a long life. Um, you know, the pleasures of life are not far away from us, really. We could enjoy life at all levels of uh, so-called financial accomplishment, and uh, uh, there are joys, in uh, potential joys in any life. But to have the wisdom to be happy with what you have, and in architecture with a simple brick, with a single piece of brick, that kind of wisdom, not many people have it. And it's possible I don't have it either. Uh, here he is. You know, I mean, I don't know how old he is in this picture, maybe 65, 80, uh, 70, 75, I don't know. But look at the expression on his face. He's enjoying himself. How many architects today, you know, formally trained, uh, you know, uh, would do something like this? I don't know of many. No, the architect is arrogantly sitting in front of his computer, uh, the drafting board, drawing lines, either digitally or manually, but the architect doesn't think to place a brick above another brick. Well, this man thought otherwise and acted otherwise, and I can only applaud him and have uh, uh, admiration for him. I think we can learn from him, but for the architect to renounce uh, his uh, Usual arrogance is not uh, uh, is not common at all. Here he is again with the very you know some uh, workers who probably 
you know, needed some uh, some uh, teaching uh, from from this unusual man and unusual architect. As you can see, he was he was there involved with life, with the building of the brick wall. He was not removed from from the dust of the of the building site so let's read a little bit about him Lawrence Wilfred Lowry so called Lowry the, from Lawrence Lowry Baker as you can see was born on March 2nd 1917 and died in April 2007 so he lived for 90 years was a British born Indian architect renowned for his initiatives in cost-effective, energy-efficient architecture and designs that maximized space, ventilation and light, and man maintain an uncluttered yet striking aesthetic sensibility. Influenced by Mahatma Gandhi and his own experiences in the remote Himalayas, he promoted the revival of regional building practices and use of local materials and combine this with a design philosophy that emphasized the responsible and prudent use of resources and energy. He was a pioneer of sustainable architecture as well as organic architecture incorporated, incorporating in his designs, even in the late 1960s, concepts such as rainwater harvesting, minimizing usage of energy inefficient building materials, minimizing damage to the building site and seamlessly merging with the surroundings. Due to his social and humanitarian efforts to bring architecture and design to the common man, his honest use of materials, his belief in simplicity in design and in life, and his staunch Quaker belief in nonviolence he has been called the Gandhi of architecture. Quite unusual. I don't think there are many architects in the world who deserve some, such, such, a, such a title. But there are interesting things here. You know, like, uh, uh, first of all, what is this, the Quaker belief? Just like uh, 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 Ralph Erskine, of whom I, uh, I talked a few days ago because it was his birthday, he also received, uh, uh, he was uh, part of the Quaker um, the movement, uh, a spiritual movement that, um, yes, advocated nonviolence. And this is something that uh, uh, monotheist uh, uh, religions seem to totally ignore. Yes, they totally ignore. That's why there are wars, terrible wars, in the name of so called God. I said so called because that's not really God. About the Christians, the the Muslims, and the and the Jews, they fight each other. Although although they spring from the same root, you know, from the same monotheistic uh, uh, system of beliefs, and from Abraham or Ibrahim or Avram. But but the the vanity of man is uh, without uh, limits. And uh, we are confronted with that at this very moment, not far away from where we are. Uh, so, you know, to, to, to believe in nonviolence and to actually act in this, uh, in this uh, sense is uh, unfortunately uh, rare. Uh, he also, he had his um, uh, uh, biography is uh, much more complex than uh, this short, uh, uh, short text uh, uh, says uh, here. And I regret I don't, I don't have a, a, a more complete uh, description of his work because he worked even as a nurse, uh, even as a, on, uh, on, uh, on sites with lepers. He tried to, this man was almost, uh, okay, Gandhi-like, but also almost kind of, Sorry for the um, maybe the inflated uh, comparison. Christ-like, this man was treating lepers, by risking uh, losing his own life. He was a nurse, you know. I mean, talking about the architect as a social worker, this man went even further. And as such, again, I think he's highly 
uh, inspiring. Anyway, let's uh, move forward and let's see a few works. Uh, again, this will be a short presentation, but we'll see a few works by this unusual man and unusual uh, architect. We'll look first at some sketches and drawings. Um, yes, uh, Southeast Asia, where he chose to live and work although he was born in Great Britain. Well, he's, uh, he's true. His sketches, his drawings are not uh, uh, so-called uh, innovative. Uh, you know, they are illustrative and they're rather modest. Uh, they are descriptive drawings. But this uh, will be also uh, uh, um, connected uh, a little bit later on with his built work. Uh, he was not, a, you know, an avant-garde artist. He was not, uh, maybe the very word avant-garde would have made him uh, feel uncomfortable because the avant-garde uh, refers to a positioning of the artist of, or of the architect in rather audacious terms. And this man, didn't aspire towards anything so-called audacious. And his drawings show it also. Now, you might, you might have the, the impression that this man was not interested in changing the world. But I think there are various ways to so-called change the world. Sometimes, Sometimes without provoking big disruptions, you could contribute to a change in consciousness and even in a change in, in aesthetical terms. On the left, you see the sketch. On the right, you see the, the house as built. Here, the other way around. On the right is the sketch. On the left is the built house. But this doesn't mean he, that he also didn't innovate. Uh, we'll see some, some, some buildings where he uh, was carried away a little bit by the desire to invent, to use the same word that I uh, mentioned before. The Center for Development Studies in Trivandrum in India. Um, yeah, it's a building with uh, you know, maybe, I mean, it's clear that he didn't have a large budget at his disposal. It is a rather modest building. But even here, there are uh, suggestions of, uh, uh, you know, sometimes subtle, sometimes more obvious uh, creativity. I love his work with brick. He was truly a master of uh, working with brick, and I think he understood brick. He used it differently than um, you know many architects who also loved brick. Maybe also because of the context, you know, the, uh, in India. Uh, the truth is, brick is a miraculous, uh, uh, and I don't, I don't think I exaggerate, a miraculous uh, building material because you can use it for structural reasons and also for ornamental reasons. So with the brick, just as we look at here, uh, functions both structurally and ornamentally. And the two emerge through working uh, creatively with brick. I keep uh, referring to the example of someone, someone who, um, uh, you know, uh, embroiders, uh, you know, who makes a sweater or anything, you know, in the act of embroidering, in the act of weaving, in the act of, uh, you know, uh, making, uh, let's say, a sweater, the one who does so uh, feels this, I would say, natural desire to implement, uh, to introduce, to make some uh, ornaments. The question is why? Like the builders of this world, why did they feel the need for this ornamentation? 
why do the old uh, peasant Slovak or Slovene, Slo Slovak woman, Slovak woman, I think, in the essay by Adolf Loos, uh, Ornament and Crime, indulged in ornamentation? It's something I think, uh, um, yes, natural when you when you weave something uh, to uh, introduce elements. Uh, of a contemplative nature in a way. You know, these ornaments have their own uh, um, desire to be, so to speak, within the structure of what you are weaving. And uh, you be, because when you, when you weave, like in this case, you weave with bricks, uh, uh, I mean, this is different from uh, building a wall, let's say you prefabricate it, uh, you know, fully in a factory, and then you bring it to the site. This is about the art of joining and the adoration of the joint, if I am to use the, the words uh, of, uh, of Luis Kahn uh, referring to Carlos Scarpa. When you work with small architectural elements like a brick, when you bring them together when you weave with them ornament is almost uh, impossible to avoid so to speak so um yes it's it's, it's uh, the bricks i think uh, even if you handle them in a so-called conventional way the bricks are very uh, uh, encouraging towards uh, making a building that is alive, that breathes, that is porous, even to use a word that um, you know uh, Stephen Hall um, uh, advocated. The brick is modest. It's true. It's it's a modest uh, building material. But as Frank Lloyd Wright said, "Give me a brick, and I will transform it in its equivalent in gold." And it's true, a brick in the right hands, sensitive, uh, creative hands, does become its equivalent in gold. Well, Laurie Baker is not uh, an unconventional architect, although his path in life is very, uh, was very unconventional. Again, how many architects today, stars or non-stars, would live the way he lived? Um, and uh, you you will see some buildings by him uh, are more uh, uh, you know uh, creative uh, than others. While I was searching for material for this presentation, I came across a, a house which surprised me, uh, architecturally speaking. Uh, and although it was connected with his name, and I thought it was by him, I felt there was something strangely different about it, the pirouette house. And you are going to see it, but it was not built by him. It was uh, finalized in 2020. But it, it would be interesting, and that's why I kept it in the presentation, although it is not by him, because, uh, because of, uh, of its uh, difference as compare, compared to the work of, um, of Laurie Baker. Laurie Baker was not uh, a man, uh, you know, risking a lot uh, aesthetically. He did risk a lot, including his own life, in his past. Through, through, uh, through the years. The eco-sensitive housing that he designed uh, is uh, times like here, more geometrically engaging. And, and this is closer to modernity than, than the house we just saw here. Yes, here we can see a certain uh, vigor and sculpturalness that would qualify the building for being uh, modern. You know, but it's still a, a modest building in the sense that it was not an expensive building. It was not meant for uh, the rich and famous. This is a building built, you know, for uh, common people in, in the area where he, where he lived and worked. Are these buildings innovative? I think they are. 
And I also think beyond aesthetics, they assume the ethical dimension of architecture. They are appropriate for the place he lived in and worked for, for the people, uh, yes. And uh, you know, there is no uh, disruption actually between the architecture and the nature around it, even if yes, uh, literally speaking, nature is very different from the buildings. But I don't see, and maybe it's because of the brick, because the brick is earth. It is earth. And, uh, you know, a uh, brick building is a building that belongs to the earth. Thus, it cannot be too disjuncted from the nature, from nature, even from trees. Now, like here, um, yes, literally the trees are looking very different from the building. He didn't try to mimic uh, fluidities or anything. The building is fluid intrinsically, not explicitly, not aesthetically, not literally. Now here, unfortunately, I have only one image, the literacy village. Um, here, I should have had, I, I searched and I couldn't find. You see though in the sketches on the left that he was also experimenting, not just with, different ways of building, but also with different formal um, crystallizations of the functions he was trying to, uh, you know, serve through his building. And here we see him again, not with uh, a lot of ease because the picture is small, but we see him there on the building site. And again, how many architects do this today? Not many, but maybe we should return to the building site, like Brunelleschi, become again involved with the blue collar workers and leave at home our white collar um, shirt. Uh, a film studio that he built. Well, you know, maybe some would say it's a little bit naive or a little bit, uh, yeah, um, you know, static or whatever. Yes, in a way. But uh, probably for the place it was built in, is, it was the right thing to do. And it, it seems he built in the rural areas, you know, like, uh, although, well, here is something else. I, I will come to this building a little later. Now, this is the a film studio. Does it look like a film studio? It's very possible the Hollywood people, the Hollywoodians wouldn't agree, but, <laughs> you know, the world is much larger than uh, the Hollywood world, although the Hollywood, Hollywood wants to, uh, you know, dominate uh, everything. Uh, but this building, it's a, it's a coffee house. Uh, it's, I don't know in, within what city in India. You see, he was experimenting even with adventurous uh, aesthetics to an extent. And maybe not only to an extent, maybe to a large extent, but the so-called traditional uh, patterns uh, in ornamental design are still present. Otherwise the building is, uh, uh, you know, uh, has a certain level of, uh, uh, you know, being uh, uh, different, so to speak. And actually, if you notice, you know, it is in spiral and uh, the tables are actually um, you know, placed on this uh, surface, which is uh, not horizontal. I hope I have an image from the inside. Yes, like here, you know, so the, the person who ser serves, uh, you know, the, the waiter or the waitress uh, works up the, the, the spiral and serves, uh, you know, whatever he serves to the tables that are uh, in, the, in the vicinity of the of the of the wall on the spiraling uh, uh, you know uh, path interesting uh, an interesting and unusual uh, coffee house isn't it lori baker we are going to see at the end of this short presentation uh, uh, um, also the work of a romanian young architect uh, and uh, quite an example. I wish there were more students and young architects here to, 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 
to learn from what this uh, remarkable uh, 24 years old uh, young architect uh, did. Anyway, I anticipated a little bit, but here it is, the building by uh, Laurie Baker, with people enjoying themselves at the table, uh, having a coffee or a tea or I don't know what. Now, what is this? Uh, it's another house. Um, I, Dakshina, Chitra, Kitra, Kenari, I don't know how to read this. But we see again the, the brick and the variety of things one can do with a brick or with various kinds of bricks. The bricks really uh, breathe. It is in the nature of, of the brick to breathe if it's not covered with plaster or whatever. Now the climate there allows it uh, more than maybe in some other places. But um, you know, the, this, this ability that brick has to breathe, to be porous, I think is a great, great, great quality. I like his architecture, it's modest, it's rural, it's, um, uh, it's uh, inexpensive. It is in the true sense, sustainable, economical. Yes, maybe not all the time his architecture is, um, you know, uh, wow architecture, aesthetically speaking. But uh, even here, you see the, the wooden structure of the building is uh, innovative and even audacious, I would say. You know, it's coherent, it's uh, clear, it functions, it's solid, it's rigid, and yet it is pleasing because it is. Uh, it is done with common sense and with, uh, you know, it, it, it doesn't uh, puzzle one or it doesn't uh, confuse one. It's, it's, it's as it should be in a way. Uh, yes, the outside of the buildings is maybe not very, you know, uh, enticing or exciting or, uh, but why should everything be like that? Now, since I mentioned this already, searching for material for uh, this presentation, I came across this house, which attracted my attention because I knew the Quaker mentality of Lori Baker, and this one seems to be different. And, but it was confusing because a lot of uh, images relating to this house had his, mention, uh, his name mentioned, but it's not by him is by wall makers and it was completed in 2020. Now, obviously the wall makers were not and are not Quakers, but I like this house. Um, I understand why this house that you are going to see mentioned the name of Lori Baker, but Lori Baker was much more modest than uh, these architects. Well, he also built earlier. Anyway, let's look at the building. It's an interesting building because in, in my opinion, uh, Laurie Baker who was, um, you know, the Gandhi of architecture. He didn't, he didn't need and he didn't uh, do pirouettes. But this, this house that you are going to see uh, is a pirouette house. So let's look at it. Actually, uh, I even placed it wrongly on the, on the invitation that I addressed because I thought it was by him because many pictures with it had uh, his name in uh, associated with it uh, with them but but it's not by him and i apologize this is the house now this almost looks like a lowry baker house it's probably not but the 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 you know the wall maker's house is indeed uh, you know uh, full of pirouettes beautifully done with this miraculous material that I just mentioned, the brick. You know, look what can be done with bricks. And this, we are talking about a house built in the year 2020. Again, it was not built by Laurie Baker, it was built by wall makers. This is the name of the architects in India. Uh, I love these walls. I mean, you can do indeed pirouettes with bricks. Although in plan it's rectangular because of these uh, uh, twisted and contorted walls, 
it becomes very special. In a way, I regret that it wasn't Lori Baker who built it. I wish it was him, but uh, he was probably too modest to try something like this. Maybe he, if he lived in the year 2000, although he didn't lie, die too long ago, 2007, uh, this was built 13 years later, but it's still, um, if there was an influence coming from Lori Baker, uh, it was uh, transcended in the field of, uh, you know, uh, becoming, uh, you know, uh, risk taking and, uh, you know, courageously uh, innovative and even uh, bringing in the architect as acrobat, so to speak. Because these things, you know, these things are probably not needed at all in terms of functional terms in terms of function, no, it, it, you know, but, but somehow they are, they are engaging, I think. And you see, even, even um, uh, you know, uh, how to say, gestures which are not uh, easily justifiable in rational or functional terms, in architecture uh, could have uh, weight, so to speak, could have uh, even meaning. Look at the plan. I could have found later on. I discovered a lot of pictures about this house uh, on Arch Daily because it is a very recent house. Was completed in 2020. The truth is, we all need surprises in life, and uh, a house which has um, innovative elements is surprising. You know, and diagonals and slanted surfaces and walls and so on, they, 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 they uh, encourage us to get out of our inertia and to assume uh, a more adventurous uh, uh, modus vivendi. It's a good building, I think. And uh, yes, this building is not built for the poorest people, I'm sure. I, in fact, I saw pictures, um, which I don't show here from the inside. These are well-to-do people, but um, I'm glad they built it. And look, in essence, the, the building is uh, Cartesian, is rectangular, it's rational, but then these, uh, these uh, walls bring in a different system. And it's the system of, uh, of uh, you know, aesthetical capriciousness, uh, even of unreason, and uh, and they matter. They do matter. And again, it's the brick. This truly magical uh, unit we call the brick. Well, you know, the owners or the clients of the architects, the wall makers, were themselves rather adventurous because we see the houses, the typical houses across the street. You know, they, they uh, provoke the street with a uh, rather unusual house. the pirouette house by wall makers in India. But now we come back to Laurie Baker. Laurie Baker said that architecture is mostly common sense. So if you look carefully at the buildings and try to understand the materials, you should be able to solve most of the problems. Well, I wish it was so simple. Now a school built by Laurie Baker you see, he also uh, was playful. Uh, the plan here is, uh, you know, very ludic. So he was not only taking the, the easiest path, you know, to, to build a building based on this plan 
required uh, you know a certain disposition towards uh, uh, towards playfulness and the brick again help him the joy of building you know just like a child plays with the uh, wooden pieces or whatever the architect played with the bricks And playing with the bricks meant also becoming at least sometimes uh, ornamental, meaning the work of the architect becoming ornamental. Now, uh, Loyola Chapel and Auditorium in the same area, tri tri Trivandrum, if I pronounce uh, correctly. This is a digital drawing of it. Uh, I hope I have images of the building uh, itself. These were done probably after. Uh, they were not done by him. I don't think he worked with, with computers. Yes, here it is. And uh, I, I would say it's, it's a good work. It's a very good work. You know, light, light as a constructive material is uh, for all to see here. And uh, there is austerity in the building. There are also fans that uh, bring in some... Uh, some breeze, some uh, you know, uh, colder air. Uh, it's it's an excellent building, and we, it's enough to look at this picture to realize it's a chapel or a church. It's 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 you, you don't need uh, you know descriptions or explanations. Laurie Baker, India. It's also interesting that he combined two functions, the sacred one and the secular one, the profane one. There is an auditorium and there is a chapel. And I imagine this world would uh, disappear or it would uh, temporarily be, uh, you know, in some way removed when uh, larger uh, space was needed. So the you know, maybe in both uh, senses, the chapel would increase the auditorium and the auditorium would increase the chapel in terms of space. And, uh, you know, the woodwork of the roofing is also, you know, uh, coherent and uh, crystallized in, uh, in, in proper terms. Let's look again at the section. Of course, the tallest part belongs to God and to light. And light is a metaphor for God. Okay, and now uh, we are approaching the end of this presentation, uh, which is too short and I apologize, but maybe next year I will be able to make a, a more um, a developed one. Uh, talking about developed uh, one, here is a development um, uh, building for the development society. But why is it that I don't have pictures of it? Well, you see, as I told you, uh, this uh, presentation is not one that I'm very, very proud of. Maybe I couldn't find pictures. It's a little difficult actually to, uh, to gather information about this architect because uh, you know, he is not one of the stars, he, he, he lived where he lived and worked, but I think we got a certain idea about uh, what he stood for, uh, and uh, maybe it will stir up um, some curiosity, uh, and uh, today it's very easy to keep searching if you are provoked by something that attracts you. I will end this presentation, though, as I promised, with the work of a remarkable young architect from Romania, that is Patricia Erimescu, who left Romania after she finished her studies at the Interior Architecture Faculty in Bucharest, went to Tanzan Tanzania and built a library almost with empty hands, somehow very much in the spirit of what Lori Baker did. And, uh, you know, this is uh, almost astonishing. This young woman went to Africa and built with the uh, local uh, uh, people, including children, 
a beautiful modest library that was, I, that's how I discovered it. It was published by the major uh, blogs and websites uh, of the world. Here it is, you know, the brick wall. We just talked about the brick and what you can do with a brick. You can do a lot truly with a brick if you are only open to being playful. But also, uh, you know, when I talk about playfulness, I don't mean an irresponsible playfulness. In a way, the brick is conducive towards being responsibly playful. Uh, here, this is the building she built with 5,000 euros or $5,000. She received the money from donations. She built the building. They, they made the concrete there. You know, she, I, I attended a lecture with her about this building and she said that uh, at first the concrete was not proper, they had to redo it. Uh, it was an ex kind of an experimental work that the village at first, if I remember correctly, kind of opposed these colors or the use of colors here on the oblongs. She did use them. All in all, it's a remarkable building built with, you know, all, with, with almost no money with children, with the people from this village. Bravo to her. In my opinion, this is a work that brings back the architect to society and uh, makes the architect feel useful uh, because, because what kind of a satisfaction could an architect have from uh, the remoteness of his or her drafting board uh, and the remoteness of his or, or, or her uh, desktop or laptop? You know, if you go to the building site and you immerse yourself in society and you work with people, but she had here the chains which she couldn't find easily in the so-called civilized world, where there is bureaucracy, where there is a, um, you know, uh, an, uh, you know, implacable uh, a need for all kinds of uh, formalities and exams and write for signature. She didn't need these things there. It was only passion, it was knowledge. And I hope I also have here the drawings she made. And you'll see that this building in all its simplicity actually even employs the golden ratio and takes into consideration the, you know, the cardinal points, the, you know, uh, the, the wind and so on. I, I was very moved and here, of course, is the majestic Kilimanjaro um, uh, mountain. Very beautiful, truly. I mean, you know, this building was probably built without any architect. Here, there was a courageous young architect who didn't even study what we call architecture per se. She studied interior architecture. And now, of course, interior architecture is also architecture, but uh, for bureaucratic reasons, we separate them. We name them differently. They're all architects, the urbanist, the, the interior architect and the architect, they are all architects in my opinion. And she proved it here. And I'm, you know, I mean, look at these people. They, 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 they enjoy their building. They contributed to its uh, coming into being. It is a useful addition to their village. I cannot be more pleased than I am. And the building is even aesthetically very pleasing. So you see, it's possible. Instead of following the banal path after you finish your studies, working for three years, as some kind of a slave in an architecture office, making coffees for the boss and moving papers from left to the right, Patricia went to Africa with bare hands and built this building. And she told me, you know, kind of jokingly, but, uh, you know, I hope it's not true what she said. She said, you know, I hope, I mean, I began my professional life by building quickly a building. I hope I don't end up, you know, uh, building nothing. Uh, I hope so too, because she shows here uh, determination, sensitivity and talent. And the children of this uh, village in Tanzania obviously uh, love it. I wish I would see students here in Bucharest equally enjoying books or, uh, you know, a globe like these children 
this this joy of 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 of, 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 of discovery of learning which i do not see actually there are more people here in this uh, modest library in a modest village in tanzania than in the library and the university of architecture in bucharest this is actually incredible but these children enjoy themselves I hope and look at the plans of the building, the traditional Maasai hut, the golden ratio, and the plan of the library she built. Bravo to her. And I'm absolutely sure that if Laurie Baker knew about this building, he would have uh, he would have applauded it too. So there is tradition, there is knowledge about uh, the most noble actually parts of architecture and combined they generated uh, this um, this building this library in tanzania that uh, patricia Irimescu uh, built and no wonder that uh, important uh, websites um, like in habitat or the zine published it it deserved to be published and here is a, a sketch a drawing she did with a section through the building, which shows, you know, concern with the, for the interior climate, for the environment. We see the sun there on the sky. We see the, you know, the how the ventilation through the building was supposed to happen. We see the trees. It's 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 uh, it's literally a building that says yes to life. And if a building does that, it does everything, in my opinion. So we see here one vents, uh, cross ventilation, window shutters uh, protect uh, the interior from sunlight. Uh, I have some difficulties to read because I have the most inappropriate eyeglasses on my uh, nose or on my eyes. But you can read green brick uh, allows uh, ventilation. Yes, it does. And I cannot praise enough this miraculous human invention, the brick, the environment. You see, you have the interior and you have the exterior. Buckminster Fuller said that the environment is about everything that is outside of us without us. And cosmos is everything outside of us plus us. So, you know, if I force a little bit, I would say that this very modest building actually has some kind of a um, you know cosmic core value but i know the word cosmic is a little bit uh, you know inflated so maybe i should abstain from using it but we see clearly here in this very page that on this very page that she was concerned with the interior of the building but also with the exterior of the building what is called the environment and and that's why i i recalled what Buckminster Fuller said. And look at the other uh, happy builders. You know, a so-called civilized society, developed society, emphatically so, would not allow for something like this. Of course not. But I think that's a, a loss. Here, these children erected their own building. You can imagine that these, these, these children would, would forget would never forget this. That building was built by them or by them as, as well. And, and, and in a way, they are like the mollusk that uh, Gaston Bachelard mentioned when he said a mollusk doesn't build a house, its house, to live in, but lives in order to build its house. It's a great difference because we humans do not think and do not act in this way. For us, we quickly build a building to move in and to use it like a tool. But the mollusk lives in order to build a house. So the house is, is, is at the end of a, an existential journey. It's, it's a, a, a crystallization of a lived life. And it's the same thing here. This library is the crystallization of a lived life for, of these children and, of course, some adults 
who also contributed to the building. And the BRICS, what can we say? We do have to take our heads off our heads because the, break, the BRICS are saluting us in the name of efficiency, uh, beauty, earthiness, geometry, and so on. And look at that. I so wish students in architecture, students in architecture would have the same curiosity like these girls here looking through the window. This joy of discovering a building that they love, a building which has just a number of books. They are not rich, but they are actually very rich because they have the innocence to enjoy a building that uh, more cynically so-called developed uh, people would, would pass by indifferently. Bravo to them and bravo to Patricia Irimescu and bravo to uh, Lori Baker. Thank you for being here today.